when I'm 90 or 100 and I can't do this anymore, and maybe I will be, I, maybe I shouldn't set that limit, but, uh, and I'm sitting there looking back at my life, am I going to be glad I went, I got up at 6 a.m. and swam the river, or will I be glad that I, you know, stayed in bed or maybe just watched a morning show or something? And, and it's very easy then to know which one you should be doing. You're listening to A New Way of Living with Dan Voss, inspiring you to a new life of breathwork, cold therapy, nature, and plant medicine. In this week's episode, my guest is Dean Hall. Dean has been a licensed clinical therapist and coach for over 30 years. Astonishingly, in that time, he has conducted over 50,000 face-to-face one-hour sessions. Besides being an author and highly sought-after speaker, Dean is also a two-time cancer survivor, widower, and world record-setting extreme-distance swimmer. He's the first person to swim the entire 187-mile length of Oregon's longest river, the Willamette River, which he did as an active cancer patient in 2014, and Ireland's longest river, the River Shannon, which is 180 miles, in 2017. His Willamette River swim threw, threw Dean into radical remission unexpectedly, healing his leukemia without chemo or radiation, while easing his trauma and grief from losing his wife 15 days before their 30th anniversary. One of Dean's greatest achievements, however, is chasing and catching the gorgeous fitness competitor, Bobby Parker Hall, and falling in love again with a woman who is as beautiful on the inside as she is the outside. Dean, welcome to a new way of living podcast. Thanks, Dan. I I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. Uh, I really appreciate all you're doing for our world, especially in the ways you're promoting uh, how water and especially cold baths can heal. Mm, yeah, yeah, I'm super happy we we connected. Um, I think it was on Instagram. I know we have a lot in common in terms of uh, mm-hmm. enjoying yeah. the water and the things that we can get from um, being in, in nature and, and being in, whether it's cold water or just in natural water as uh, as a whole. Right. And we also are uh, fellow Oregonians. I was born, I haven't really, I don't think I've shared this before on the podcast. <laughs> I was born uh, just outside of Portland in Oregon City. My family, we lived in Westland, which was just the next town over. And uh, you're, wow. you, you said you're about yeah, 10 yeah, miles yeah. Uh, down the road from Oregon City? Yeah, yeah, up in Happy Valley. That's right. Yeah, and I, I think it's so funny. After every everything I've been through, I ended up in Happy Valley. I think that's perfect. <laughs> that's a that's a great name. It really is. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear. I you know I, I shared some of your story in the bio, but I'd love to hear from your perspective. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. uh, the the swims that you had at the Willamette River and River Shannon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Walk us through. Mm-hmm. What that mm-hmm. was like, why you did it? Because I'm sure some people are thinking, why, why would you swim mm-hmm. 180 mile river? Um, and I believe you were the first <laughs> to do the whole length of the Willamette River. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I thought, I thought once I did it, it would kind of be throwing the gauntlet down, mm-hmm. and everyone would do it, and you know, try to beat my. T- to this day, I'm still the only person that's ever done it. Wow. Um, two others have. Uh, two other uh, Irishmen have swum the River Shannon now. Okay. Um, and it was so funny. I got there at, at just the right time because as I was swimming, you know, it's a small island and the Irish are super friendly. Mm. Uh, I just fell in love with them over there. Uh, they were all like, oh, Dean, I've been planning on doing this forever. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm doing it now. Uh, and and one especially uh, did it the very next year mm. um, and just shattered my time. But he had really, really good weather. Uh, but why did I do it? Well, uh, in 2013, I was dying of leukemia and lymphoma. I had lost my wife, uh, my first wife, uh, only three years before. And I grew up here in Oregon uh, to the son of two native Oregonians as well. And they both uh, were mountain climbers. Mm. And so in my childhood, 
I had the best childhood I think anybody, especially someone like me, could ever have. Because while all my buddies were uh, binge watching Scooby Doo marathons for the weekend, <laughs> I, I was like climbing Mount Hood. You know, yeah. I come back and I, it's like, oh, wasn't the weekend boring? And I'm like, well, I'm, I, no. Wow, <laughs> and they'd be yeah. like, really? What did you do? And I'd say, well, I, I climbed a mountain or two. And they'd be like, what? Um, and especially in a time in the 60s and 70s, as women were gaining more empowerment and more equal rights, you know, there was my mom up there uh, climbing with the guys, you know, mm, and doing yeah. her thing. So it was it was just a, a wonderful role model. But 2013, I was dying. Uh, and it was devastating for me because uh, my parents, one of the things they did really well, too, and are still doing well, is they really loved each other. And parents in the 60s and 70s, I, I can't remember, maybe one or two of my friends had parents that actually liked each other, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't common. Yeah. Um, and and so here were my parents, they were kind of crazy about each other. And, and that was really my biggest goal in life is to find somebody and, and kind of recreate that. Well, I uh, played a lot of soccer and had scholarships all over the U.S., almost ended up in Chicago um at a little college called wheaton um but uh went to this tiny college in kansas and fell in love with a cute little kansas farm girl and put myself in exile for love and so i actually lived in kansas for 30 years wow and when she died uh i i felt like i'd been not only robbed of her love but robbed of the place i love for 30 years and so it was just very very devastating and uh so as soon as she died within a year i moved back home to portland mm -hmm. and uh thinking that would be a good idea not doing the math in my state of mind realizing i was giving up all my adult friends and a private practice that had been booming uh and so it was like all of a sudden i had no one and i felt like nothing Mm. And uh, right now I'm right at 219, 220 pounds. I'm six, one and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, I was down to 158 pounds Whoa. and I didn't even recognize myself. And so uh, one day I, I, I made the habit. I kind of always have because I've never been um, what my dad calls a pretty boy. Uh, I, I, when I am in front of a mirror, I rarely take the time to look cause I pretty much don't want to. Um, yeah. but in those days I really was avoiding looking at myself. Mm -hmm. And one day I walked into the bathroom and just happened to look at myself and it was shocking. You could see every rib, you could see my collarbone, you could even see my shoulder bones. Um, I looked like I just stepped out of Auschwitz or something. You could even wow. see my pelvis. Um, it was, it was ugly. And I looked, I caught myself in the eyes. I looked myself in the eyes and I had these deep set red rimmed eyes. And the thing that hit me is the guy I was looking at just looked so sad. Mm. And I thought, you know, if I, I've had a good run, I've kind of accomplished everything I wanted to. I've, I've, uh, I was a weekly columnist for eight years. I've taught public school. I've written a book. I, I've done a lot. I, I developed a, a private practice. I had this good marriage. Um, I've had a good run. I think I'm done, mm -hmm. you know, and if I just let the leukemia take me, nobody's going to know. Mm -hmm. Uh, they'll just think, oh, that's too bad. And then I remembered, I had this 21 year old daughter that had just lost her mama. And I thought, boy, this is an entirely selfish thought. I, I cannot nurse this. I do not have the luxury of thinking like this. Mm -hmm. And so I had helped people come back to life in my private practice by becoming passionate about a purpose. Victor Frankl, uh, who had been an Austrian psychiatrist and had actually been in Auschwitz, found that the people that survived were not so much those physically strong, but those that were passionate about a purpose, mm. that that was proportionate to whether they're going to live or not. And so I'd seen that to be true. And so I looked and looked and looked and begged and prayed uh, for a purpose. And it was crickets. <laughs> I mean, mm. I, 
nothing came to me. And so about three weeks after just begging, um, I thought, well, you know what? I haven't unpacked my boxes at this dark little duplex. Maybe I should just clean my house while I'm waiting for the universe or God to speak. Sure. And so I started doing that. And one of the first boxes I opened, there was a journal I'd been forced to keep when I was in sixth grade. And I thought, I wonder what the six year old, sixth grade Dean had to say. So oh, that's I, cool. I flipped it open and it said, when I grow up, I gotta climb Mount Everest, swim the English Channel. Wow. And for the first time in three years, like an electric shock went through me. I, I'm even getting goosebumps now, Dan, as I, I talk about it. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, that's what I gotta do. And I'd forgotten. All, all I'd ever wanted to be was a sponsored adventurer, uh, you know, and I thought it was possible because I'd met a bunch of my parents' friends who were doing that. And mm. I just wanted to go around the world climbing and doing these badass things. But, you know, then I settled for a practical life, right? And it was good, but I'd totally forgotten this dream I had. And immediately I thought, okay. I've got leukemia and lymphoma. My immune system's decimated, so I know I probably can't handle the food in Kathmandu or uh, elevation um, because my blood's just not carrying oxygen well. Right. But I can swim the channel. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why I thought I could. And it, every time I thought about it, I'd get excited. Mm. And I started having this war with myself. Um but then finally, that's what I decided to do. So I called one of my good doctor friends and I said, hey, guess what I'm doing? And he's like, uh, trying to stay alive. And I said, no, I'm going to swim the channel. And he's like, Dean, you got a bad immune system. I mean, it's terrible. If you get in a public pool, it could kill you. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? Uh, die sitting on a couch watching Wheel of Fortune? I'm not going yeah. out that way. Right. And, and so I just made a wholehearted commitment to making my purpose, uh, swimming the channel. Mm. And that's, that's, that's so cool. kind of what started this whole thing. That is so cool. Yeah. And the yep. first time I, first time I got in the, the pool and kicked off, uh, it's the first time I felt like me again, because I did a lot of triathlons in the eighties and nineties. Okay. And so I did a lot of laps. And so it was like going home and it just to have the water moving over me. I thought, you know, if I die, I die, but I die mm. doing something. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's yeah. such a great story. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, you know, one of, one of my favorite movies <laughs> is uh, it's called The Life, uh, Life is Beautiful. And I'm not sure if you've heard of it or seen mm. it. Mm -hmm. I think it was a best, a best picture winner uh, in the 90s, maybe 2000s. And uh, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. takes place in during World War II, during the you know confinement uh, camps. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't want to I don't want to give away the whole story, but this father was sent away to one of the camps with his son. The boy was like five years old, and instead of oh wow, kind of caving and just giving into you know the the immense pressure and trauma and telling his his boy what was actually happening, which would have just crushed him, and he probably wouldn't have been able to survive. He decided to tell him a little white lie that, you know, this uh, it was a big white lie, that all this was just a game. And he, he <laughs> kind of made it, you know, a fun out of it. Right. Like you know, we're going off to you know, oh, wow. this this fun place. And, um, you know, the, the objective is to survive, you know, to get through each day. And you got to find these different things. And if you find these different things, you get points. And then the people that have the most points at the end of the day, they win. And then if you win the whole thing, you know, they you get I don't know if it was like a you you get a ride on the tank or something. So he, he told his son, it's like this whole thing was a big game, hmm. right? And, and when you said uh, that, you know, I think it was Victor Frankl that said uh, that the people that mm -hmm. had purpose were the ones that were more likely to survive um, in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. that reminded me of that story of, of finding purpose to, to wake up every day and realize that, you know, there's something greater out there. Even if it's not today, you may... It may, it may right. be tomorrow. It may be in a week. And uh, when you get to that point, you'll realize, you know, the trauma that you went through, the difficulty that you went through, the challenges, it's worth it. If you can just fight through it and uh, come out on the other end. So that's one of my favorite, um, my favorite right. movies. It, it definitely resonated. 
I'll have to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I'll it's a great watch it tonight. Yeah. It's a great movie. So it is in Italian. Uh, they have English subtitles, but um, that's the only. Not oh. downside, but the only thing I can read. That's fine. Some people have a hard time <laughs> with with movies in a different language in terms of like focusing, yeah. but such yeah. a beautiful story and beautiful yeah. message. Yeah, mm. um, I'm a big nice. fan of uh, extracting lessons from you know certain situations in life, mm-hmm. certain things that happen to us. Mm-hmm. What would you say, you know, doing those two different swims, what were some of the biggest or the biggest lesson that you learned about yourself and about life? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the biggest is that, I mean, there's so many, Dan. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think that what makes me uniquely suited to doing these ultra extreme distances is the suffering I've already experienced. I uh, almost died four times um, and then saw my wife die and then just suffered with that loss mm-hmm. after. And so when uh, things, when, I, when I'm cold and I'm tired and nobody cares and in the Shannon, the Shannon, the riverbed is slate and flint. Mm-hmm. And when it breaks, it creates razor sharp edges. And so, and then uh, it's uh, the most, since it's a fairly slow moving river, there's uh, the banks uh, are very uh, reed covered. And when those reeds break off, they're like bamboo shoots. And if you accidentally put your hand on one, it pokes right through. And so I bled every day in the Shannon. Wow. And, you know, sometimes that wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. Um, But when that gets really difficult, the the suffering that I've already experienced, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing to do this. I'm not in a hospital bed scared out of my gourd. This is pretty good. Mm. So that's one of them. That suffering uh, helps you to grow in ways that will then uh, uniquely prepare you for whatever it is that you your gift you have to give the world mm. will become. Wow. Yeah. That's it so cool. gives you the muscles that you will need. Yeah. I think that's what I... So that's a big one. Yeah. I think that's what I enjoy most about whether it's breath work or meditation or being mm-hmm. in being in nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also love the Wim Hof method mm-hmm. and and even things outside of Wim Hof method, but just cold exposure in general, ice baths, mm-hmm. going into Lake mm-hmm. Michigan here in Chicago, you know, that of winter, is that feeling yeah. of being alive, right? And and I think that's the premise right. of doing right. things like that, uh, doing that hormetic stress, is that yeah, you're putting yourself in a very stressful right. situation. But it is uh, a reminder that we're alive, we're well, we're strong, we're resilient. Um, that to me is the greatest, greatest thing of, of all. Well, and that's one of the big lessons I've learned from all of this too. And the whole reason we went to Ireland in 2017, uh, since I'd only done one, and by the time uh, the 2017 swim came up, I'm 57 years old. Um, That's not too sexy to sponsors, okay? (laughs) And so since I was just kind of a one-hit wonder with the Willamette, uh, I I couldn't get any sponsorship, Mm. and uh, at least minimally, and not enough. I, I realized to take myself over there, and I decided my daughter by this time is 24, and I decided she was going to be my guide boat or my kayaker because in order to swim a river, uh, you've got to have somebody in a kayak about 10 yards in front of you mm-hmm. uh, picking the line in the river because uh, danger, number one, other boats coming, they're not going to see you and you need somebody waving them off. Uh, and also, especially in the Willamette, there were all sorts of uh, gigantic trees that would fall into the water wow. or create log jams. And then there were some pretty big whirlpools and different things like that. Uh, and so you can see about 10 feet in front of you or about a half a mile in front of you, but danger is always about 20 yards in front of you. Mm-hmm. And so you need somebody helping guide you through. Well, I, I'd healed so much 
with my time in the water. And it was so good for my grief mm. that I wanted that for my daughter. Yeah. And not realizing the peril I was putting her in, taking her over there and saying, okay, you're responsible for getting me safely 180 miles. Huh. Uh, because 23 out of the 25 days, we had a, a 10 mile or more headwind. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the River Shannon is really just a series of lakes. Two of them or three of them are considered, they're so big, they're considered inland seas. Mm. Uh, they're about 18 miles wide and 23 or so miles long. And okay. people drown in them every year. Wow. Uh, on, when we were on Loch Derg, we got blown off twice. Uh, and, you know, it, so it, it wasn't safe at times. Mm -hmm. uh, but the whole reason without sponsors, I, I realized it was going to cost about ten to $12,000. And I was newly married to Bobby by mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take my new wife and my daughter and we're going to do this thing. But the whole reason I did, um, you know, at my age, it's not real, probably smart to take money out of investments to go swim a river. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did so simply because as you mentioned, life is, if I've learned anything, life is short. And mm -hmm. if you wait till someday uh, and then you're going to accomplish your dreams, you're going to end up at the end of your life never having accomplished even half of what you could have. Wow. So like you, I love doing these things, the cold water immersion, the swimming, all that, because it it's a beautiful expression of being fully alive. Mm, yeah. yeah. I think that may be my biggest fear in life is getting to the end of my life, sitting on, laying on my deathbed, and looking back and knowing I could have done more. And I, I try to use that yeah. as a catalyst, as a driving force every day to remind myself, you know, we don't know when this this clock is up. And I want to make sure that um, I'm right. mil milking the crap out of it as much as I can so that when that my time does come, <laughs> I can look back and say, I did everything I could. I, I gave it my, my best shot. That's super wise. That's one of the wisest things and one of the best approaches to life. As long as it doesn't, it's got to be balanced. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't tip over that scale and make you anxious. Yeah. But almost every day I use the rocking chair test. Uh, when I'm 90 or 100 and I can't do this anymore, and maybe I will be. I, maybe I shouldn't set that limit. But, uh, and I'm sitting there looking back at my life. Am I going to be glad I went, I got up at 6 a.m. and swam the river, or will I be glad that I, you know, stayed in bed or maybe just watched a morning show or something? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it's very easy then to know which one you should be doing. Yeah. Um, what's the best choice? So I, I love it that you're already thinking like that. Most people, you know, because I've been a ther therapist for 30 years and I've listened to thousands and thousands of people. Most people, Dan, don't get to that point until their 40s or 50s and they're starting to see, you know, that they don't have a lot of time. Yep. I mean, have you experienced trauma or something? I mean, have you have you had somebody close to you die? What woke you no, up to um, thinking like that? I really, I really haven't experienced. I'm very blessed. I had a beautiful childhood. I have very minimal mm -hmm. trauma. Um, the, the most important mm -hmm. people that I've lost in my life are my grandparents, and they all lived full beautiful mm -hmm. beautiful lives um and more recent oh, wow. past in terms of how i've applied breath work and and the cold exposure and then just trying to mm -hmm. like i said make the most out of every day i have um well i i can think of actually two mm -hmm. in in recent history the first one was when kobe mm -hmm. bryant died tragically in that helicopter crash uh, and yeah. i remember that yeah. week uh just laying in bed every morning just thinking i don't know why it hit me so hard because we we see celebrities pass you know we people come and go right and other celebrities that have passed i i never really it never hit me in that way but there was something about kobe bryant being yeah. i think what 40 and leaving a wife and and kids behind and then his one daughter tragically died with him and then not to mention all the other family the right. other people that were in that helicopter and and knowing kobe his potential 
I, I think he's, he's, a, he accomplished so much in his life, but I, I knew he had so much more right. to do. And, uh, and right. not to mention it's like, you know, somewhat similar age. He's only 10 years older than me. I'm, I'm turning 30 this year. So that for me was just like a wow. big, and I actually, I, it even caused me to, uh, set a reminder on my phone. I have a, a little alarm that goes off at uh, 9 a.m. every morning and it reads, uh, God gave me another day. And what that does is it, wow. it puts me in a mind frame of, and mindset that this is a gift. You know, I woke up, I, I very easily could not have woken up, right? And a lot of people go to bed and they don't wake up the next day. Yeah. And uh, for me, that's just a really good gratitude practice. It, it grounds me. It, it makes me more present, more, more grateful. Um, so that was a, a big one uh, in terms of kind of being shaken up a little bit and realizing, you know, we're not yeah. guaranteed another day. And if we get one more day, then that's a gift from God. So that was the first one. And then, uh, and that's got to make Kobe. So Kobe's got to be so happy that that impacted you that way. He probably mm -hmm. thinks about that even more than one of his championship rings. Mm -hmm. Cause most people don't ever get there, Dan. And yeah. the fact that you're getting there at, at the start, what I consider <laughs> the start of your adulthood, the right. start of your life, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens for you. Um, Thank you. I appreciate Because that. I too practice that same thing. Every day when I wake up, I'm like, what's the date? Okay, this may be the last July 26 I ever have. How mm -hmm. can I squeeze the most out of it? How is it different than last July? Mm. And, and some of my friends think that's kind of morbid, but they don't realize, and it sounds like you do, how much zest that gives you to just be here now. Yes. So that's 100%. super cool. Yeah. It's a great practice. And then yeah. the other thing that was more recent, yeah. uh, my girlfriend and I broke up last summer and, uh, that was, that was pretty tough, you mm. know, just something kind of out of the blue. And as yeah. you know, like whether it's a uh, heartbreak, you get broken up with, I mean, obviously having a spouse pass away is even more tragic, but it's still a form of, of trauma, you know, going through a breakup and, um, it was tough and I was really yeah, blessed. Heartbreak is heartbreak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was really blessed to have been introduced to the Wim Hof method, um, just a few months before that breakup. Mm. And I remember kind of just really laying there like I, this is, this is a tool that has been placed into my life for this reason, for this time in my life. And I decided I was going to do the breath work and a cold wow. shower every day. And I did it for, uh, I mean, I still do a cold shower every day. The breath work at least three mm -hmm. to four times a week. But I, I made sure in those like two weeks, cause it's usually right after a breakup or any kind of loss, um, that first few weeks, first few months mm -hmm. are the hardest. Mm -hmm. So I made sure I did for, I think yeah. it was two or three weeks straight. I did the breath work every morning then got into the cold shower. And then even just you. on a daily basis, wow. if I ever felt like pain, you know, if you kind of just feel that pain in your heart or you think about her or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. it is, you just, you know, you kind of get that anxiety or you get just that you get flustered or you just right. you feel like right. you're going to cry or break down. Anytime I had those feelings, um, I would let myself cry, but I also remind myself just breathe. And when you learn about your breath Good. and you can slow it down and be conscious of it, uh, that's, I think, the most powerful thing. It really so. is. Yeah. I, it, that's, that's fascinating. And it, it fits with what they're learning with trauma and grief recovery too. Mm. Um, in 2014, when I was preparing, it was January of 2014, I knew the Willamette was going to be right around 40 degrees. And so I knew I had I, never heard of Wim Hof. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was just kind of getting his start and he hadn't hit the big time over here yet. You know, this is seven years ago. Right. And, and, but I knew I needed to start acclimating my body to this temperature because, you know, I'm, I'm still a cancer patient. And I had gotten to the point where I, I kind of wanted to live now. Right. Um, and so I started taking ice baths. And being a therapist, and this is the ironic thing, in the Midwest, I was considered an expert on grief. I'd led seminars, written articles. <laughs> and once I lost my wife, I even called up two of my clients and apologized. Wow. I'm like, you know, everything I knew was from the books. I, I probably didn't do a very good job in there. They were very gracious. They're like, Dean, you did your best. We knew you didn't know. Mm. And I'm like, well, sadly, I know now. And, and But... Uh, 
even with all I knew, I just couldn't get rid of just this thousand pounds on my chest. And I'd been meditating since 2000. Mm. And so I, I did the breath work, but that just wasn't giving me very persistent relief. Sure. But the first time I got in an ice bath, uh, I call it poor man's shock therapy, Dan. <laughs> it was like, wham. Yep. And, and with within seconds that that pain in my chest was gone mm. and it lasted for at least a couple hours yep. and i thought wow okay i've found something that will short circuit that heaviness and even if i have to do a couple ice baths a day it just gets me more prepared for the lament yep. um and yep. so that's that's really how i i really got into ice baths yeah that's i great. didn't hear about whim until until after my swim and I'm giving talks and people are like, have you heard of Wim Hof? Yeah. And I'm like, no, but I better look this guy up. Right. Yeah. 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 It's fascinating stuff. And I, I mentioned earlier the idea of uh, yeah. being more resilient and, and strength. I think that's the biggest takeaway mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. when I get into a nice bath or do the cold shower or, or cold plunge. And you probably feel the same way with, with your mm -hmm. cold exposure or the mm -hmm. river swims. Is that when right. you can do that, right. that sense of accomplishment and um, feeling of, of resiliency. It's like whatever else that is thrown my way that day, I feel like I can overcome it. It's pretty cool stuff. Exactly. Yeah, or I'll be sitting in a boardroom or a staff meeting and people will be getting anxious and starting to get conflictual and nerves will be flaring. Yep. And I'll just be sitting there and, and thinking, you know, they weren't in a tank that was 35 degrees today. Exactly. Or they just didn't swim. Uh, because one of the, one of my favorite things that I started doing co during quarantine, when they closed the pools, they didn't close the rivers. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to river swim. Nice. And what I started doing is swimming at half a mile to a mile downstream and then turning around and swimming back upstream for Ooh. that amount. And it is what I call the training of truth because I get about uh, 10 yards or so, depending on the current, on each stroke going downstream. Mm. I turn around, I might get an inch or two. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And to know that you've got to go a half a mile to a mile with only, I mean, literally inch by inch, your brain just starts screaming, no, I can't do this. And you just learn how to just breathe through it and yes. keep going. And and so by choosing to do the hard thing, like you're mentioning, Dan, it it, it generalizes into every area of your life. So I, I think it's really one of the best people, best things people can choose to do. Yeah, I agree. Along the lines of it helping with stressful situations or trauma, um, and then of course there's all the mm -hmm. the physical benefits of it, right? For and I'm I'm talking um, right. cold right. exposure, but I'm sure even just you know your right. river your river swims have the same effect. Um, but in terms of physical uh, benefits, you know it reduces inflammation, it helps with uh, muscle recovery. Um, just a host, right. host of other things, but I, I get more out of it from the mental health side of things. Like we were talking about, like dealing with stress mm -hmm. and trauma. Mm -hmm. Another big thing right. I think is depression. Um, do you have any thoughts on how it can help with somebody that might be facing depression? And really it kind of goes along the lines of what we've been talking about with, um, maximizing mm -hmm. life and, ha and having that appreciation for life. Do you have any thoughts on, on how this can help right. with depression or any kind of mental health well concerns. so much of yeah i well i've anybody really since about 2016 when wim's research uh from holland started coming out and there were real easily verifiable results mm -hmm. uh you know it wasn't just anecdotal anymore i started pushing clients uh, to do cold water immersion or something mm -hmm. and along those lines. And I've had a host of them actually follow through and do it by creating their own cold water immersion tanks or buying one from my favorite cold water immersion tank supplier, Morozco Forge. And I'm so excited about them because Rogan just posted yeah. a couple days ago in his own, that was Morozko. Okay, when you he said that word. He called it Morozko, but yeah. you know, he's got a little to learn. When you yeah. said that word, I'm like, I think yeah. Rogan said that and in his video. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've I've been sponsored by them. They nice. sent me a forge two years ago, and cool. they're just fantastic folks. But uh, it's been one of the best lifestyle hacks I've ever had because I keep it there in my garage at uh, between 36 and 38 usually, mm -hmm. uh, get it in it the first thing every morning. But as far as the mental health benefits, so much of anxiety and depression is about chronic states of helplessness or powerlessness. Mm. And when you get in an ice bath, you find that you can work with your autonomic nervous system rather than just try to think your way out. It gives you real power. Yeah. Um, and it's almost a knee-jerk uh, reflex that your your body, your brain will be just shocked and it'll be flooded with endorphins, serotonin. But what they've also found, WIMS found, is it's flooded with oxytocin, mm -hmm. uh, the most powerful natural chemical that many times, the only time we get it is during orgasm. Right. Uh, so uh, it's just all these feel good. It's, uh, and then Plymouth University did a study a few years ago. They found it doesn't matter your age, culture, gender, um, race, that if you get even to a slight shiver stage, that you have what's called cold water euphoria mm -hmm. for at least an hour or two after. And so once people find that they can do that, uh, it gives them power. And the more empowered they feel, the more they are empowered to handle their anxiety and depression. Mm. Plus, the mind loves habit. And if it knows you're empowered, it's going to start letting go because I believe anxiety and depression are simply uh, the body is the ultimate feedback mechanism. If you're off track, it's it's going to try to get you back on track by creating something that warns you. And so I see most forms of anxiety and depression as kind of like a dashboard light on your car mm -hmm. saying, hey, do something. Yep. But most of us don't know what to do. Wow. And one of my favorite hacks for both anxiety and depression are cold water immersions. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, I, to me, a shower is okay. It's a great place to start, but you just don't, I feel, get the full benefit that you do when putting your whole body in. I agree. I, I get a lot out of the cold showers on a daily basis. Just, I mean... A, it's easy because it's mm -hmm. right there, and um, right. And right. B, B, it's just you know something that's easy. Going back to habits, it's like easy to just do on a daily basis. But anytime I've done sure. the sure. cold plunges in in a lake or a river, or an ice bath, um, the effects that I have from that, they tend to last a few days longer. They're they're more profound. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The big one that I didn't really expect going into it would be improvement of my sleep after a cold. Uh, a mm. cold uh, plunge or an ice bath i sleep so right. hard that right. night it's amazing it's really amazing stuff don't you yeah yeah it's great yeah and i found uh you know wim's a big fan of going from really cold to really hot right. and i've found i don't know if it's my age or what but if I do that midday, I don't get anything done for the rest of the day. And I've been so busy that I needed a really, really good night's sleep last uh -huh. night. And so that's exactly what I did. I got in my uh, Morosco nice. Forge for about 10 minutes, just got really yep. cold, and then went upstairs, got in my big bathtub, got really hot. Mm. And, man, I was out like a light. Yeah. It's, it's one of the most beautiful hacks I've ever found. Yeah, yeah. it's remarkable. I mean – Back to what you were saying with the mental health side and some of the science there of what it provides us, um, mm -hmm. emulating mm -hmm. drugs. And that's what's so cool to me is when I tell this to my friends and my family, how whether it's breath work or the, the cold exposure, how you can get some of the same effects that you would get from, from various drugs, but it's done in a natural way. It's free and it's natural Absolutely. and it's healthy and it's, yeah. it's just remarkable. Right. I'm I'm happy and I and I, I'm is. sure you're happy that you've discovered it. 
Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, if I if I hadn't, I'd probably be heavily medicated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which which is what most of, yeah. of America yeah. is, you know, heavily medicated. And uh, uh, sadly, yeah, that's a topic yes. for for another day, I guess. But um, I right, guess well, right, actually, right. that is a good good segue because I uh, it's a great segue. I was going to get into uh, you know going back to your um, leukemia and and choosing not to have chemo mm-hmm. and, and radiation. Um, and your Willamette right. River swim actually put you into to remission. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how that went right. down and, and what was the deciding factor of um, not going with, with chemo or radiation? Well, what a lot of people don't realize is chemo and radiation has uh, very limited success rates. You never hear that. Um, most, it depends on the type of cancer and, of course, the severity of it, but most chemo's got like a 9% success rate. Whoa, I didn't know that. Um, and Joe, Dis- no. um, Joe Dispenza's found that so much of any kind of medication is the placebo effect. Mm. We already have the chemicals in there uh, to heal us. We just need to know how to connect with those and unlock them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he purports, and I... I I don't think there's enough really great science behind it yet, but the, even the success rates of chemo and radiation are, for most people, so much better because they have been trained to believe in it. Mm. And the thing that bothers me is with most oncologists, it's the go-to, and they don't even give you a choice. Yep. And I had a couple oncologists fire me because I believe I'm the boss of my body. Yep. And so I'd give them you're on my team talk as <laughs> on the first on the first appointment I say, "Hey, I'm pretty sure you're smarter than me. Please don't hear me being res- disrespectful, yep. but you won't have to live with the outcome of your decisions. I will." Mm. And so you, I'm going to listen to you, but you're not my boss, you're my consultant. Yep. And a lot of them wouldn't have anything to do with that. (laughs) But I just seen so many of my um, clients have long-term neuropathy or brain fog or hardening of their arteries, these uh, really awful side effects. And so I decided that unless it's my last ditch option, I'm not going to, unless it's, I'm throwing a Hail Mary, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do chemo or radiation. Mm -hmm. Because I'd read so much about the power of the brain and uh, this new field called eco-psychology, how nature heals. Mm. But I had, when I went to swim the Willamette, I was just trying to inspire other cancer patients to refuse to give up. I, not in my wildest dreams, because again, I didn't know about Wim Hof or cold water immersion. And as I got in, the first two weeks, the first 14 days, actually 16 days, The water was 40 to 42 degrees. And when you're in that for eight to 10 hours, uh, that was, that was the hardest problem. Uh, the biggest challenge, even with the three mil wetsuit, I was having to get out about every three and cause I was down to less than 3% body fat at this point. Um, and, and so I didn't have much insulation and so, Within 30 to 45 minutes, I was starting to go into thrombosis or deep core throttle. Mm. So I'd have to get out onto the riverbank and do jumping jacks, run in place or burpees uh, just to warm up and then get back and do it again. Wow. And so this constant um, dance with hypothermia was the hardest challenge. Little did I know it was jacking up my immune system through the roof Mm. and uh making my metabolism just become the metabolism of King Kong and doing and getting my lymph system going because, uh, you know, as you're swimming, I, I only breathe about every five or seven strokes. Hmm. And so basically I'm doing deep breath work for eight to 10 hours a day. And, uh, as near as my oncologist can figure, that's, that's what burned out the leukemia. That's so cool. Is just that constant hypothermia. Yeah. If you don't mind yeah, me asking. It was, it was a miracle. Yeah, it really is. 
And if you don't mind me asking, you, you've been relatively healthy since then, right? The last two or three years? Well, yeah. No, I've been In terms incredibly of the healthy. Uh, I feel, yeah. Uh, the type of leukemia that I had was chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Okay. Even my present doctor, uh, I, I had to fire him because my primary care, because I met him on a Zoom call and I told him that I'd had this radical remission and it's the current belief that you never get rid of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, wow. that it doesn't go in remission. You just manage it. And I told him that, and he just looked at me like I was an idiot. Wow. He's like, no, you still have it. I'm like, no, I don't. The tests show I don't. And he's like, well, that doesn't matter. The test must be wrong. And I'm like, they're from the world's number three expert. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure he's yeah. right. And he's like, no. And he put it in my file that I've got. God. And I'm like, I don't have it. And and he didn't do any tests. So, wow. um, yeah, I, I'm in, I am totally free of that. Afterwards, though, the lymphoma really started to come on with a vengeance, mm -hmm. I guess, because the leukemia was gone. And I'd read about forced bathing mm -hmm. from the Japanese. Yeah. They found that uh, this thing called phytoncides emits from pine and fir forests and it boosts the immune system. Yep. So they, again, wanted me to do chemo and radiation. And I told them, hey, uh, give me six months. And they're like, oh, here we go again. And I said, if, I'm, if my numbers aren't any better than they are now, I'll do mm -hmm. it. And so I started going out all night in deep into the Mount Hood wilderness, nice. getting off the trail about a mile where nobody can find me, yep. just with me and my backpack and hammock and laying there, breathing in, praying and meditating. Mm. At first, I was doing a lot of crying yeah. uh, and just letting all that go. Yep. Uh, but I started that May of 2015. By March of 2016, my lymphoma was gone. Wow. And thankfully, I've been healthy as a horse ever since. That is so yeah. cool. So cool. I love that. I mean, that's such a big part of what I'm yeah. doing with this podcast is, is natural. I don't want to call them hacks, but um, more lifestyle habits right. of being out in nature. and Habits. That's a great way. Habits, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just all the healing benefits of, of being in nature, whether that's through the forest or in water or getting sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. another topic is, you mm -hmm. know, our, our lack of sun exposure, especially someone like myself in, in Chicago, you know, we get, you know, maybe decent amount of yeah. sun to half the year, if that, um, and, uh, yeah. it's just, there's so much there with, with nature, with breath work, with the cold exposure, um, that I right. think we're just starting to in the last, I would say five years, uh, especially in the U S and the Western culture come around to the, these ideas mm -hmm. that have been around, mm -hmm. Like you said, the Japanese have known about forest bathing or, or what they call uh, Shinrin Yoku, I believe. Forever. They've known for thousands of years. You yeah. Know? So right. um, it's fascinating yeah. stuff. It really is. Cool. Um, is. I'd love to pivot a little bit towards your, your work in clinical sure. therapy. Um, in terms of, well, I guess mm -hmm. I should start off asking you, who are some of the people that you're working with? Are you working with individuals? Are you working with couples? Like what's your kind of main clientele there? Yeah. Uh, mostly working with individuals. Okay. Um, I'm also a certified clinical hypnotherapist. I hate to use that word hypnotherapy because it scares people. Mm. But what I do is I help people just like I help them learn wellness habits, mm -hmm. especially if they've got a chronic health condition. I tell everybody, I always wanted to be a big shot. I always wanted to be somebody special. But the power in my story comes from the very fact that I'm not, mm. not at all. And so I tell everybody that I work with, especially if they have a chronic health condition, if you uh, if you do what I do, you'll get what I got or better. Um, I'm you know I make sure they stick with their doctors and stuff because I'm no doctor, but I do a lot of that. But I also uh, just like our body has all these chemicals that are. Uh, prone to healing, our subconscious does too. We just need to know how to access that because our subconscious is, as you know, what runs all the body systems. But what a lot of people don't know, even a lot of therapists, it's where you store all your long-term memory and mm -hmm. all your emotions. Mm -hmm. So it's a therapeutic gold mine. Mm -hmm. And if you get down, there are several different brain states. The state just above delta, which is asleep, is theta. 
Theta is the point at which the 10% of your conscious mind fully interfaces with the 90% of your subconscious. So if you get to that high theta, you're connected, and all you have to do is ask, why is that depression there? Mm. What's, what started it? And it's wow. usually a traumatic event and that's been discounted because in your adult mind, you don't see how traumatic that was to the child. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you as I've worked with rape victims, how many times I've slid right past their rape or molestation to a playground incident mm -hmm. where they made a belief system that is still running. Because once you make a belief system, it runs unconsciously like a computer setting. Yeah. And so I just help them change that belief system. They get better. Wow. Uh, just last month, a multimillionaire uh, guy on Instagram who found out about me flew me down to Miami. And because he was doing a multimillion dollar deal and stuck. And he's like, Dean, can you help me get unstuck? And I'm like, absolutely. So he flew me down. We worked for a couple of days. And now he's he's just killing it. That's so so cool. mostly I work with individuals. Yeah, it's really fun. It's super rewarding. I was just going to, that yeah. was the exact word I was just going to say is it's got to be really rewarding uh, knowing that you're making a difference yeah. in people's yeah. lives where they can get unstuck, whether it's in the, a relationship, their business, right. just day-to-day -day life, they can get unstuck and then go out and accomplish the things that they want to accomplish and live life right. fully. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Right. Um, in terms of relationships. Yeah, it, it's very rewarding. Yeah, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, going over to, let's say, re romantic relationships, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, mm -hmm. maybe maybe one piece of advice you would offer. Because obviously, you know, you were in a marriage for 30 years and, and now you have Bobby that you've had a right. successful and beautiful relationship with. And um, as I, I shared yeah. not too long ago, I, I went through and the And they were very, in many ways, they were very different personalities. Is that right? Yeah. I bet, and I, I bet that mm -hmm. was uh, an interesting thing for you to have to, like, not not have to, but you, in order to succeed, you would have to navigate those two different personalities, right? You spend 30 years with someone with one personality, and then right. you're meeting Bobby. Um, what was that like in terms of a different personality with a different woman? Yeah, both of us, because she was married for 30 years as well. Okay. Uh, sadly, not so happily. Okay. Um, and at first, we just had to be very honest. And uh, Gay Hendricks uh, wrote a great book on relationships uh, called Conscious Loving. Mm. And he's, he calls it microscopic honesty. And I love that. Just down to the bone honest. Uh. And there were several times in the first couple of years we had to sit down and say, hey, I'm sorry I reacted that way. But when you said this for 30 years to the other person I was married to, it meant this. Mm -hmm. I now see that I accidentally put her face on your mm -hmm. head or his face on my head. And, uh, and we just have to talk it out and make sure that we were intentionally being married uh to the person we're married to yeah that's um, a challenge. and and that that's it, it is a challenge but thankfully having somebody so kind and mature enough to have those discussions mm -hmm. it just brought us even closer but that mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest challenges if i were to give anybody some advice and and people are either going to love me or hate me for this. <laughs> um, but I've seen it work time and time and time again, so much so that when I decided that, hey, I'm, I'm not going to die. And uh, I, st I, I still have a lot of life left and I'd, I'd love to have another partner. I did this. Um, I made a list. Uh, and it's, it's part of that visualization technique. I, I realized the first time I was so young when I met Mary, she just knocked me off my feet and, uh, there really wasn't any conscious choosing. Um, and we made it work even though we were total opposites. Mm -hmm. This time I made a list of about 12 things that I felt would be a perfect match for me, not a perfect person. I didn't expect a perfect person. But 
what would be a really, really good match for me? And then every night, especially when I was lonely, I would very prayerfully visualize mm. uh, wonderful times together with this person. And uh, one of the things I had on my list is she had to be as fit or fitter than me. And when I showed that to my parents and then some of my friends, they're like, yeah, Dean, you're going to be single. The rest of your life. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't think so. And they're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then they met Bobby and Bobby's got better abs than I do. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing sometimes when your wife's got these great abs and you're like, okay, I'm nothing. <laughs> uh, but when they, when they met Bobby, they're like, oh, okay, yeah. well check that off your right? list. Yeah. That's so, so cool. It's, but I think what I think what happens, Dan, is when you make that list and start visualizing, it recruits that subconscious to all of a sudden have a good radar. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I'm so happy. You yeah. And I, I thought, I thought might as well just go for broke, <laughs> um, because I was already pretty happy. I thought uh, she's got to be. I think my actual words were terrifyingly beautiful. Yeah, I um, love that. <laughs> and so when I met Bobby, I was like, holy crap, there's no way. And I'm like, well, let her decide. I'm not going to mm. decide. I'll let her decide. Yes. And and then when my buddies saw her, they're like, what's she doing with you? And I'm like, hey, <laughs> I'm just going to let her decide. <laughs> right? I love that. I'm yeah, so happy yeah. you mentioned that because I actually did the same thing. I'm glad I, I'm, I'm on the right track here. Oh, really? um, a few months back, I, I wrote out a list. Yeah. And I have to be honest, I, I haven't reviewed it in a while. So I, I think that's the next step is making sure I read it on, on at least a daily, you know, a weekly, daily. Basis, if not daily. Yeah. And um, what that does yeah. is, like you said, it, it almost kind of manifests that into your life. Like for me, it does. whether it's it relationships does. or anything else, if I make a list or write things out of like who I want to be or what I want in my life, uh, you become that person. You know, if, if I want somebody that's going to be right. loving and compassionate and honest and beautiful and into, you know, fitness or, or whatever else that I have on my list, then if I'm expecting that from someone else, I have to be that as well. And uh, I think when you do that, exactly. things start falling into place. So thanks for that reminder. I'll be uh, revisiting right. that, that list on a daily basis. And then who knows? Maybe I'll the find love. The only place <laughs> it fails. Yeah. You will. Not maybe. You will. The only time it fails is when a person is 90% of the list uh, and people settle. They're like, oh, okay, well, that's kind of it. Uh, Good. Um, and I refuse to do that. And the times I've seen people, it feels kind of hard mm. to just say, well, uh, gotta let you go. Uh, you're not everything that would be a good match for my future. It sounds kind of selfish. Uh, and I had to do that once with a, with a lovely woman, mm -hmm. but she just wasn't everything on my list. Yep. And I could see that that would make me feel um, like I'd settled and yeah. I, I think she deserved more than that. Yeah. 100%. And, and then six months later, uh, there was Bobby and man, she's not only everything on my list. One of the things I've discovered is there are things that, uh, she is that I wasn't even smart enough to put on my list. Wow. So that's cool. And, and that's what I've seen happen time and time again. Yeah. So cool. Good for you. And like I always say, Dan, if it can happen for an old broken down schmuck like me, it can happen for you. <laughs> I if appreciate you it. Do, if you do what I do, you'll get what I got yes. probably better. Oh, that's so cool. So, I appreciate yeah. that, Dean. That really is, is very nice of you. Yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. I have one final question um, for you. Okay. Before we get to that, sure. where can people learn more Sorry. about you and find you online? Uh, they can find me on my website. I'm not there much anymore. I need to update it. It's called swimminginmiracles.com. Okay. Uh, and someday I'd like to tell you about that and why I call it that. It's not just because I do these long swims. Um, but, uh, I'm on Dean Hall official on Instagram or on Facebook all the time. Love uh, it. probably the easiest way they can get a hold of me is just DM me on and I, I take real pride, no matter how many DMs I get, I always I always respond. That's great. I love so, that. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. My last question I have for you is around your definition of health. Um, what does health mean to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. 
it means balanced and moving forward uh, mind, body, and spirit. Mm. But I have come to believe, Dan, that you cannot be truly healthy unless you're in love with yourself, in love with others. But here's the big thing and the missing piece, in love with nature or uh, having natural engagement with the planet mm. itself. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot there to appreciate. And um, that's amazing. I just appreciate you, Dean. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. There's been so many moments where either I have the chills or I'm just sitting over here smiling. So I just want to say thank you for uh, oh, thank the, you, the work you're doing and, and keep it up. Oh. Well, thank you. And thank you, Dan, for being a guy that's half my age but it sounds like uh, somehow leaped over a lot of the things I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> and I can't wait to see what you're going to do next because we, I can promise you the way you're thinking and, and the commitment you're making to living each day and then mm. doing these uh, active physical engagements uh, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna bear fruit. There are big things on the way for you. I, Thank I just, you. I'm thrilled to have gotten to meet you and, and participate in this with you. Wow. Thank you, Dean. I, I really, that means a lot. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, this has been a joy. Thank you for your, for your time, your expertise, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Okay. You too. It's been a pleasure, Dan. Thank you.